Okay, we are live. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to um, this afternoon's Right Hassle uh, virtual agricultural event. Um, as many know, this uh, we normally hold a um, sort of a reasonably large event before Christmas, and obviously with everything that's happened this year, we, we postponed that. Uh, and this is what we did in order to um, uh, give everybody a chance to, 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 to see us, talk to us, uh, and do something a bit different. Uh, I'm Joel Wolfe, as many of you know, I'm one of the partners in the agricultural team. Uh, and I'm going to be chairing this afternoon's uh, uh, discussion, which is very much a question time event. So wearing a headphone and doing it on a Zoom, I think I feel more like an air traffic controller than a uh, than David Dimbleby. Um, but we'll see whether I make sure I can't get, you know, make sure I can keep the uh, um, uh, everybody from crashing into one another. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. The session is being recorded today. Um, it will be posted on to various social media feeds. Um, if you um, will be keeping the sort of everybody that's listening on mute, if you don't mind, that cuts back on feedback. If you have a question you want to raise, if you could pop it into the, um, there's a, if you hover at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a Q&A. Um, and if you go in there, you can, um, you can type in um, anything or also or stick it in the, the chat. Um, the running order for today is, will be quite swift. We want to, to keep it to an hour for, you know, as close to an hour as, as possible. So that does mean we won't be able to get to uh, everybody's questions. Do apologise for that if, you, if you're, you're burning to, um, to ask a question, but uh, time, time may not allow us. Um, but we will try and cover as varied a uh, subject matter as we can. So running up to Christmas, the UK leaving Europe was, was I think, apart from COVID, the only thing I saw on the news. Um, it was interesting to see that the deal, you know, a, a trade deal was done on Christmas Eve. Uh, and we are now starting to see the impacts of that trade deal with news coming out of Northern Ireland of um, gaps on shelves, um, lorry drivers having their ham sandwiches um, confiscated as they cross the channel um, and the disgruntlement that will clearly, um, clearly cause a lorry driver if his lunch has been taken from him. Um, but as many politicians have said, we are now trading freely across the globe. We have trade deals. There are a number of trade deals that have been in place, but otherwise we are, are in a new um, new era for, for UK trade, and that includes UK agricultural trade. Um, so this afternoon, we're looking to discuss dis discuss that. We're very lucky and very grateful to have with us three, three people who will ask to introduce themselves in a second. Um, but we have people from um, have a farmer from this country, have a farmer from Australia, uh, and a professional working in the area who, who will give, them, give us their views on our questions. So for no particular other reason than they are um, the furthest from where I am physically sitting at the moment, um, I just ask each panellist to introduce themselves, say a little bit about themselves in turn, uh, starting with um, Jane and Kevin Fuchs-Pickler in Western Australia, please. Hello, well, I'm Jane and I am English, but I married an Australian farmer, and so I've seen both sides of the coin. Um, we farm together in Wheatbelt, Western Australia, which is uh, a bit dry and arid at the moment. And I've also been involved with the equivalent of the NFU, which is WA Farmers here, and do a bit of political lobby work. I'm also a farmer, so Jane and I and our son, we farm together. We farm about 10,000 acres, um, mostly arable, with um, anywhere between two and 3,000 sheep. Uh, for the sins, I'm also a director of Australia's largest cooperative, which is a, a grain handling and marketing cooperative. We receive, handle, transport uh, grain. It owns four ports. Uh, we, this year, did over 15 million tonnes is what we received. Our best day was um, about 590,000 tonnes we received into our network in one day. So we have 20, 20 million tonnes of storage and we trade with almost, mostly Southeast Asia, all the way through to the Middle East, and a fair bit of rapeseed goes into the EU. And um, so I personally have been in the, the offices of the trading houses, places where they buy our, our grain in um, China, Japan, nearly every country in Southeast Asia, and the farmers of West Australia who are a member of this co-op 
also own about eight or nine flounders throughout Asia and Turkey and basically Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia and Turkey and the Philippines. That's me. Right. <laughs> thank Jenny, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, John. Oh, you're on mute, John. There we go, you're off mute. Hi, John. Yeah, thanks. Hey, look, if we had a pound for uh, in the last year for every time, if you had a pound every time someone said, I think you're on mute uh, over the last year, we'd all be pretty wealthy people, wouldn't we? So, so apologies for that. I just got one or two things, a couple of slides I'm going to share, Joel. Uh, I hope those are coming up okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so, again, who, who am I? Um, my name is John Giles. I'm a divisional director at Promar International. We're a consultancy company working in agriculture and food. We're owned by a much larger sort of PLC agribusiness, a largely animal genetics company called uh, Genus. Um, I, I had a bit of a shock on LinkedIn when... Uh, this year, uh, in May of last year, I got a message saying, John, you've been at Promar for 30 years. Thought, wow, well, how on earth that happened? But it's um, never been a dull moment in, in all that time. And I've been very fortunate that uh, Promar and Genus have sent me around the world, you know, more than once. It sounds like, Kevin, that you and I probably should have bumped into each other at some point by the sound of it. Uh, but I've been lucky. I've been very fortunate. I've been to about 60 countries around the world working on various projects, looking at the whole agricultural supply chain. I've been involved in one or two uh, industry organizations, uh, the Institute of Agricultural Management and the Institute of Marketing. And I'm, for my sins, I'm the chair of the current city food lecture held in London. I think in terms of, you know, where would I come from um, without preempting anything we might be asked to comment on later on, uh, Joel, uh, Europe, still our biggest export market. It's just, you know, if you look at the nature of the deal we've now got through Brexit it's just a bit more difficult to serve that you know the no tariffs no quotas I'm not sure we could have asked for too much more there's going to be a bit more paperwork and there might be a few more ham sandwiches confiscated along the way but those are sort of relatively minor things I would have thought I think we see not just for people in the UK but around the world you know huge opportunities in the emerging markets but when we in the UK when we move out to Southeast Asia and in Indonesia I think is a place I've been to a lot over the years we're not the first cab on the rank. We, we can have market access to places like Indonesia in the future, and we hopefully will and probably will. But when we get there, we're going to find that Jane and Kevin and all their mates have been there for maybe 20, 30, 40 years before us. So we're not always going to be the first cab on the rank. I think I, think I like to think our provenance and standards are high, but they're only part of building an export market. And it's, you know, it'd be a bit foolish to think that no one else in the world has got high provenance and high standards. Building exports takes time. It's hard work, basically. And I think having market access is one thing, but building a market presence is another thing. And I think we, we our, our food exports in the UK, actually, over the last sort of five, six, seven years, have actually been increasing quite significantly. But there's an awful lot we can learn from other people who've been doing this perhaps a little bit longer than we have. And I'm thinking about people quite close to home, Ireland, New Zealand, further away, Australia, further away, and not least places like countries like Chile, who 30 years ago probably didn't export very much at all, and they've come on in absolute leaps and bounds. And we can learn quite a lot from how these other countries... Everyone's done it slightly differently. We can we can learn from one or two other people. We shouldn't think that... We haven't got to sort of totally reinvent the wheel here ourselves. That's, that's me, um, Joel, and thanks for inviting me to... Be involved with this afternoon and look forward to talking to you with Jane and Kevin and, uh, and Duncan later. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and last, but by no means least, um, just because he is the closest to me geographically, um, Duncan. Good afternoon. Thank you, Joel. Hi, I'm Duncan Andrews. I'm a director of Henson Andrews Limited. We're a farming company based in the Cotswolds in England. Uh, we have mixed farm. Uh, we total of 1,800 hectares or 4,500 acres of arable. All combinable crops, wheat, barley, all seed rape. Uh, we're a bit of linseed, some beans on a bit of ground. Uh, this year we're growing for the first time some rye and some canary seed. Um, we ha also have uh, 400 acres of very extensive grass, which we graze with a mixture of commercial ewes and rare, and rare breed livestock. Uh, the rare breed livestock we have are part of a, an important national collection 
and we have a farm park which was the first one to open in the country and this year we'll be celebrating our 50th birthday so the Cotswold Farm Park attracts over 160,000 visitors a year um, as a range of different indoor and outdoor attractions and we have a caravan uh, site and accommodation units adjoining the, the farm park too it's, a, it's an important part of our enterprise uh, my business co-director um, Adam Henson is a presenter for BBC on their weekly uh, country file program he also does some presenting for other television and radio programs um, he's also involved with doing corporate work including being the farming ambassador for Lloyds Bank um, and undertakes a range of other corporate activities we have a pretty diverse business um, we uh, are approaching this next period of our agricultural journey with some trepidation, but we do see that there's opportunities, uh, more of which we're, we'll look forward to discussing shortly. Thanks, John. Great, Doug, thank you very much. Just a word of warning to everybody out there that if Kevin and Jane start talking about paddocks, they're not talking about the six acre piece of grass out the back of the yard, they are talking about 600 acre fields. Um, it's something that always surprises me when I think of the scale and the difference in scale between um, the UK uh, and uh, Australia and other companies, countries around the, the, the world, that it, it is you know, what, what we might think of here as being a large farm is but a postage stamp sometimes on their scale. Um, so thank you everybody for that. So we've had, um, have had some questions in beforehand, so we are going to start. And as I say, if you do have questions, anybody do pop them into the chat. We really good to hear from people as we go through. So question one, the first question we have is, what are the day-to-day -day realities of trading agricultural goods globally? We've sort of touched on it already, but, but there are some real realities that are coming into to play in the UK, which we have never seen before. and We're going to have to get to grips with. John, if I could start with you on that one, please. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I say is if people are thinking about exporting and they're thinking on a day to day basis, they're playing the wrong game. Um, exporting is a long term commitment to, to be made and you uh, selecting the right market. Um, selecting the right partners doesn't happen just by by accident it usually happens as a result of a lot of thought going into sort of where you want to be and and and, and what you want to be doing in these markets <clears throat> i think there's a there's a there's a but the realities are that there's a whole combination of things that you need to be thinking about so most people can understand tariff barriers it's 10 percent. it's five percent it's no percent whether you understanding non-tariff barriers can be particularly challenging so i think understanding tariff barriers is one thing non-tariff barriers understanding non-tariff barriers again is a, is a, another thing altogether i think we, we we've worked with companies in the uk but also we have clients in places like south africa and chile i've mentioned and peru and uh, oceana countries as well and they they almost accept the highs and lows of exporting as part and parcel of what happens you can have a great year the, the exchange rate can move nothing to do with you um, you can have a great year when the exchange rate, exchange rate moves in the right way. You can have a really difficult year if it goes the wrong way. But it's almost sort of accepting there will be good years and, and, and bad years. It's hard work building market presence, building the contacts, building the understanding of the market. The, the best exporters we see around the Joel, around the word Joel, are you know, they're really expert at what they do. They really, uh, they're really expert at the markets they operate in as well. Um, and I think we often see that the best exporters have a balanced portfolio of markets. So, um, you know, sort of, uh, we, we've done work with people in Chile who have, have been going uh, great guns with fresh fruit into China, and absolutely fantastic. And until you know, sort of, the Chinese economy takes a bit of a downturn. The the uh, the problems with COVID last year meant that, that suddenly, you know, China didn't look anywhere near as attractive as it, as it had done in the past. So having a balanced portfolio, you've probably got to have about three or four really key markets, but there may be a number of other, other sort of secondary markets that you're also operating in to give you that sort of balance and um, not having all eggs in one basket. It's a long-term process. Um, balance of, balanced portfolio is really important. Uh, exports are not for everybody. It's very, it's very glamorous. It all sounds very glamorous. So encouraged you know not least by our politicians to sort of let's look at the opportunities outside the uk for some companies in the uk they shouldn't even look out they, they should concentrate on the market here in the uk so you, you you don't get into exports just you know for the sake of it you you get it because it's a part of a 
structured decision making process you've taken as a business. Jane, Jane and Kevin, I mean, Kevin particularly with the with the work with the, the co-op, you know, your co-op. What's your view on on that question? Well, your home market is your most important first. Um, you've unmuted me, yes. I have. Um, that is your most important, but in our case, we produce far more than we can ever possibly absorb in in this country here. So, you know, ninety five percent of what is produced in Western Australia is exported throughout the world. Whether it's the Middle East, Southeast Asia is our our back door. Um, there, that's our shop, our customers. And one of the things we have to remember. It is not your next door neighbour who is your competitor. It is the, somewhere in the world market, which is our competitor. And uh, so we have uh, places, Argentina, uh, the Black Sea, they've really come in and uh, probably taken uh, 20 or $30 a tonne off the value of our grain. Their grain doesn't have the quality, when you're going overseas, relationships are really important. So you need a good relationship with the customers that you've got there. It takes many years to build that, that up. Some of the people that we deal with go right back to, in Japan, right back to helping them out after the Second World War. Uh, how this cooperative got started, the farmers in Western Australia were really being, I'm trying to think of a nice word, but screwed by the three big ugly sisters, you know, the Cargills, the Louis Dreyfus, the ADMs of this world. And <clears throat> during the Depression, uh, the farmers had signed contracts to supply them with grain. They planted the grain. When it came harvesting, it was all in bags in those days. The contract stated that you had to buy the bags off the, the three ugly sisters. And... Uh, the price of the bag, two thirds of the wheat in, in the bag was actually given to them to buy the bag. So we thought we'd had enough of this and a few really, really clever people in the past transferred us into bulk. So that was in 1933 that started and that has now grown to Australia's third largest um, privately owned company with a turnover of in dollars, so divided by two if you want pounds, it's pretty close, uh, about two and a half billion pounds turnover. Um, and But it's the relationships. When you talk to these people in Japan or, or, or in Jakarta or, or um, in um, Ho Chi Minh City, I keep trying to say Saigon, because uh, we, our the ability that this co-op has been able to achieve is, gives them the comfort that they're buying the grain directly from the farmer. And the cooperative has taken over the control of that grain right from the farm through the shipping to their flour mill. And in some cases, we're 50% owners of the flour mill. So, but that's not to say that we don't have issues with... Um, Cheap products coming in, lower quality. Um, you that's, do. That's have... what happened with the Black Sea. Often the quality, of, we can guarantee our quality, but if it's two dollars cheaper in from the Black Sea, then often they'll take the cheaper product. So um, the the quality assurance isn't always the answer. I, I think one of the other things that um, is a uh, a thing that we've experienced in Australia quite more often than we'd like to is the, the politics getting in the way. So you might have good relationships and um, and then in, in, in the example of Bob Hawke some years ago in the Iraq, Iraqi war, suddenly we had a whole shipload of lots of shiploads of wheat that weren't paid for. Um, because Bob Hawke said we're going to war, then the Iraqi said we're not paying for your wheat. Um, and to this day, from 1982, I think it was, we haven't had our wheat paid for, so we get dribbles every now and then. Um, and a similar happened with the uh, live beef export to Indonesia, the animal liberation people 
put a whole heap of stuff on the television and said it was cool. And overnight, we had the trade stopped, and there were thousands of cattle ready to be shipped that couldn't be shipped. So you, you, the the political um, intervention can often cause the trouble when the, the nations themselves and the customers are quite happy, but politics can get in the way, and you know, so you, you do have the ups and downs. Yeah. I mean that politi- that politics I- I- issue, I think, is. I- is an interesting one because it, it it seems it certainly seems to me that that UK politics, particularly over the last probably twelve to eighteen months, maybe a bit longer, has been very much driven by short termist decision making. Sometimes because of obvious reasons, sometimes because of, of sort of political decisions. Duncan, I mean, how how would you see if, you know, the longevity needed to build the relationships? Um, that are suggested are, are required for sort of successful trading, o, o, international trading overseas. You know, how how you know, are we likely to see the the politics match that? Well, that is a very interesting question, Joel. Thank you. Um, I think the I think the difficulty is that we have we don't have international or national food policies, so. It becomes party political and therefore and the policies are around short-term benefits during the term of our ruling party um so i, I think they're all <clears throat> i think there's a whole load of larger scale issues moving away from like, the, the ones that we have as producers about global food security about national food security about food quality that our policy makers need to get a grip on um which need to be apolitical and Perhaps if something good is to come out of this terrible situation we have with COVID, it may be a growing realisation about the fact that we do need to have good quality food because human health, um, underlying health, has a bearing on our vulnerability um, to things like COVID viruses. That we do need to, we have a, a terrible obesity issue in parts of the developed world which we need to be addressing which is around um, our diets which um, which needs to be addressed and we do have a very uh, scarce stocks in certain parts of the world that um, undermine or make us very vulnerable to food security uh, issues particularly when we live in such a volatile political climate as evidenced by what's going in the states at the moment so I would like to think that, um, that governments will have a more joined up uh, view and policy on food production and whether the UK uh, leaving the EU will be an opportunity for the UK to start writing its own food and farming policy remains to be seen. Certainly picking up on the points that John Bain and Kevin have made about export. Fascinating to hear what I have to say and the scale on which particularly the Australian guys are thinking about business. For us, although we, you could be, we could be considered with four and a half thousand acres of arable to be a reasonably large scale arable farmer in our part of the world, but actually I don't believe that our market for us as a business is export. I believe that we, uh, I don't think we can compete on the global market because of a number of reasons on scale to our underlying cost base. Um, and um, three, uh, perhaps, you know, the things we all have to confront, although Jane and Kevin would laugh if I said, you know, we, we, the challenges we have around weather. Um, but we, I, where I think there's an opportunity is to be producing for the domestic market, is, which is where we can add more value. Um, personally, what we're doing is all of our wheat is going to local, it's going to flour mills, some of which we've now got going into a mill, which we've got a one-to-one agreement with, uh, they're within 10 miles of us. So that gives us some security on price and a small premium, but it's much also about developing a longer term supply relationship. So, and I think that's, so which comes back to the point you were making about international relations. So I think we need to start a small scale and that's locally. All of our raw seed rape or canola goes into a local, another local farm that's cold pressing rapeseed oil and uh, that's being sold to Sainsbury's. So we get a premium for that, but we've also got a joint storage arrangement. So it's about collaboration. 
our barley um, goes to two uh, maltsters within 40 miles of the farm, uh, one of which um, is then providing a brewery which is producing a beer um, which has a provenance trail. So we're adding some value to that and we actually get a small commission on that beer. So there's, so there's, there's ways within, within each of those commodities we're adding a small amount of value. Having said that, I would love to get closer to the consumer. We're still only, we're still essentially a primary producer. So whilst our markets are local, we are trading um, global goods and globally traded goods. And so there's a global price for those. And we're ultimately, as, much, as hard as we're working to add value, we are still price takers, not like price makers. And um, we, uh, would like to continue to develop markets where we can have more control over the value and the margins we're making, but that probably is going to involve a degree of processing or creating longer term relationships with those partners we're working with. So I think collaboration has a lot to do with it. I do think within the UK grain trade, there is a, it's also, they're, they're as short sighted as our politicians are. There's very, there's no long term trading relationships, it seems to me. Um, that they, um, there's lots of kind words, but they will um, always go, it's always lowest common denominator when it comes to price rather than looking at setting up two or three year deals, for instance, with a guaranteed minimum price and sharing any profits ev evenly and sharing the pain. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty disillusioned with grain trade generally. Um, so um, I think we've got a lot of work. We personally, our approach, our strategy will be looking to develop local markets, finding ways of adding value, but bearing in mind that we are, whilst we continue to produce commodities, we are, those, the underlying value of those will be determined by a global uh, tr trade. Hey, Duncan, that's great. We have just, we've had, had a couple of questions coming. Do keep your questions coming through. Um, John, just before I come to you on that point, because I know you, you want to uh, make, um, make a point we've had a had a question coming in on the chat um kevin and jane uh, and duncan if you could just have a look at that it looks like we've just got the old sort of um farmers competition about uh, to see uh, what, what what general um, tons per acre people are getting so uh, my money's on cotswolds doing about 40 tons to the acre at the moment um so um jane and kevin let's it'd be interesting if you could pop it into the chat and we'll see what what um and duncan if you could just pop it into the chat we'll see where how the two areas compare uh, um yield wise um but john you wanted to come back on that sort of point about yeah. Politics. It's just a, a bit of a PS, really. I mean, I think I, I found it really interesting to hear what Jane and Kieran were talking about and, and, and Duncan as well. But so, you know, the sort of the macro political uh, aspect of exporting, you know, governments do crazy things around the world and they can kibosh the, you know, the best export projects overnight, basically. And I think this is, all comes into understanding the risk and reward of partic particular markets around the world. How risky are they? What's the size of the prize? Usually, the bigger the bigger the reward sometimes the bigger the risk that you have to take to um to, to access that reward and so you need to think very very carefully about how how you know, how a risk adverse or you know some some companies welcome risk you know working in risky markets for for lots of businesses it's probably not the best best idea i think again i think around the world i mean i've, I've been lucky as i said joe i've been to been sent to all around 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 the world by promar and genius and yeah, I remember one client saying, "Just look, tell us, John, where the easy markets in the world are." And I said, "Well, that's a really easy question to answer because there aren't any. If there were, we'd have found them by now. I don't think there are any any easy markets. Even working in your own, I mean, I've, I've, I think I've said this as you know to people in the UK who are sort of selling food products, you know, no more than thirty miles from 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 where they're based. Don't, don't think this is easy." You know, only the best people will be able to do this, basically. And whether it's a whether it's th whether your market is thirty miles away, or three thousand miles away, or six thousand miles, there aren't any easy markets in the world. They're all highly competitive. And the the, the com comment you made, Jane, about sort of, hey, look, you know, you got a great quality product from Western Australia, but if someone's five dollars a ton cheaper, mm, yeah, people, you know, sort of. Um, I can remember in Indonesia, uh, uh, which sounds like you've been out there, Kevin, quite a lot. The one guy was telling me quite proudly how disloyal he was to his suppliers and that he would change the price, you know, if it was, you know, $5 off a price of uh, a ton of skim milk powder. He said, yeah, I'd change. He almost made a virtue of being disloyal. Um, different cultures around the world. 
we would think, oh, that's terrible. He thought that was completely normal, basically. So understanding risk and rewards, recognising there are no easy markets, recognising that price is always going to be an issue, basically, and the relation, the relationships are absolutely critical in this. You can have great relationships with people on the other side of the world and a lousy relationship with somebody five miles down the road is my experience. I mean, that's... That, that's really... the acres, John. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, go on. So, so we've got Dun Duncan has got three to four tonne an acre. I'm sorry, I don't work in metric on areas. I have no idea how big a hectare is. Um, <laughs> Jane and Kevin, go on. What, what roughly broadly yields? Well, we're about... A good crop's a tonne to the acre. If that'll give you a bit... Because we're multilingual over here. And um, it, it varies a bit around the state because it's a huge state. The closer you are to the coast, the higher the rainfall is the rule. And the higher the rainfall, the higher your crop production. So closer to the coast, you might get um, a four tonne to the hectare crop, whereas where we are, it might be a two tonne to the hectare crop. The downside of that is we've got the big distances as well. So our freight to port is more expensive, which is why I'm trying to get our railway lines back open. So freight becomes a very big percentage of our budget because of the distances. And because we export 90 to 95% of our products from West Australia, um, the freight is a very important aspect and we've got to get it all to port. We ship out of um, Geraldton, Quinana, Albany and Esperance. So there's four ports, the biggest is Quinana, and that's the area that we ship to. But we have to get through the metropolitan urban, urban sprawl to get to our port. Again, that's why our trains are very important for us. The, the, the cooperative owns its own fleet of trains. And the farmers just went and bought them all in the middle of the GFC. And um, when, we were in a, when we went to America to sign the contract, we, they were just gobsmacked that you could get 5,000 farmers together to to buy $170 million worth of trains uh, when their factories were empty. You know, we've just had nothing to do. Just quickly on their production, it's interesting that your cost of production per tonne is lower than ours because you can produce so much per acre. Whereas yeah. we, are, we, we are so moisture poor, poor that um, we're limited to our production because of moisture usually. Jane's dad, who was a farmer, summed it up nicely. He said he fights with the wet and the cold, and he many times he'd come out and help help us harvest or, you know, on the farm. And he said you're fighting the dry and the, the heat. heat. You know, so it's choose your enemies really. There's no easy place to farm. But we do grow our crop in the winter, and frost can be one of our big problems in September. Frost can decimate the crop. So yeah, we've got we've we've got a few things to juggle. Um, moving on to the next quest question, so the, the UK now, it's outside the EU. Uh, it's interesting, it'll be interesting to understand, you know, both internally and externally, how the perception of the UK market has changed because of that. You know, now that it's outside the EU, is it is it now a more attractive global um, um, market for people? I mean, I, was, I would expect, you know, for the likes of um, America and Brazil, sort of it, it, it is, and maybe, you know, externally for us to export say into Africa but are we seen and I suppose probably this is, is, is probably Jane and Kevin you're the best ones to answer this first is are we seen as a competitor on the world stage or actually are we seen more as an attractive market to export to? I would say an attractive market to export to if you look back to before the uh, common market a lot of Australian goods went into England and when England went into the EU, and I was still in England at that stage, um, as when I was an exchangey travelling around, it was a bit of a shock to me of just what an impact it had on, on Australia. Thousands of acres or hectares of fruit trees were ripped out because they couldn't send their tinned peaches to Europe anymore. Okay. And the UK, and uh, it affected lamb exports. So it had a massive impact on Australia. And um, so I suppose the big focus here will be, can we import back into, into the UK as they did prior to them going into EU? 
we had to find our own. When before before the UK went into the EU, you were a big consumer of our wool industry. Australia is the largest producer of wool. Uh, when you went into the EU, that absolutely decimated our wool industry. Um, I was a kid just dragged out of school to go back and work on the farm. And what bailed us out was tearing off and finding new markets, and it was Japan that pulled us out of the out of the mire as far as our wool industry goes. They took our wool, they used it to make their traditional Japanese garments and all the rest of it. And I can remember sitting in the rugby club at uh, Willen Hall, and some there was a, I think it was a Datsun factory that was about to be built in the Midlands there somewhere, and somebody had a crack at the Japanese and said they're wrecking our, our industry. They should have dropped more bombs on them. And I said they dropped them in the wrong place. They should have dropped them here because if it wasn't for the Japanese, I wouldn't have been able to afford to come over and see my in-laws. I nearly got killed, <laughs> especially in the rugby club. <laughs> but we do see you as a, um, a potential market not just for grain, but for meat, for, for anything. So we'll be banging on your farm's doors because we will do anything to stay viable and because there's no safety net. And I would say farmers in the UK will have to start looking at how to be as economical as possible. There's nobody to pick you up if you lose all your subsidies. You, you really have to look at your inputs in and scrutinise them. And this lady is brilliant at it. I think, I think you have to change your budgeting techniques and um, talking to friends at farm in the UK. And um, part of your budget has been the subsidies, you know, can you get the stewardship subsidy or whatever. Whereas our budgeting is always, how can we keep our inputs down in case it doesn't rain, in case we get a drought. And so you're always looking at keeping your costs down so that if you have a bad year, the, the hole that you're in isn't too big to jump out of the next year. I mean, that's a, just before I come to Duncan, because it sounds like Kevin has you know, laid, laid the gauntlet down at, at, to uh, UK farmers there. Um, just, just it'd be useful, I think, Jane and Kevin, we've had a question on the on the Q&A part. It's just asking, you know, are, are there subsidies in Australia? Because uh, obviously we have the, the BPS in this country uh, and coming down, but... Um, you, as I understand it, also you get no help whatsoever from the government. No, no. no. Um, when I first arrived, they had a um, drought, uh, a, a drought loan. If you'd had a run of droughts, you could qualify for a drought loan, which gave you a cheaper interest. But that's all gone out the window. So basically, no, there's nothing at all. And so, you know, in the situations like when the um, live export was banned for the cattle out of northern Western Australia. Um, there was suicides, there was bankruptcies, there, and they've actually just had a court case, high court case, and, and they, have, they have sued the government and been successful, but you know, it's too late for some, some farmers because it was an overnight change of policy which caused dreadful, dreadful problems. Um, so no, there's, there's, there's no help. We have no subsidies at all. So uh, thank, thanks for that. Duncan, it, it does sound rather, as I say, uh, Ke Kevin has thrown the gauntlet down to UK farmers. How, how, do, you, how do you respond to that? Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Kevin. I suggest <laughs> a sort of a challenge, I'm sure an export challenge is um, that um, I'm prepared to take on. As, as I said in my previous answer, I think that we've got, we should be concentrating on our domestic market um, because... Um, it's going to be very difficult for us to be competitive internationally given our high cost. It's interesting to hear what Jane said about unit cost of production. It would be interesting to have a comparison on that. But we are a very heavily subsidised um, industry, particularly um, on the, our arable side of the, uh, the business. Um, and we have become very reliant on that. We've become subsidy junkies, you could argue, in this country. I think that's um, not been a good thing from the point of view of being competitive. I think it's stifled R&D uh, um, and innovation. And we're going to have to, as an industry, go on a very steep learning curve now to find a way of farming in the absence of direct support. 
I'd like to think that we've been fairly innovative on our farm in terms of adopting new ways of managing soils, using inorganic nutrition where we can, improving soil health, diversifying our cropping, seeking local markets, and adding value where we can. But even so, it's very much our, our farming profitability is still pretty marginal. We're very much dependent upon market values. We don't have a great deal of influence over those. And this year we've seen wheat values range from 130, you know, if you take over the last 15 months, 130 up to over 200 pounds a ton. That's not because of anything we've done. That's just luck or, you know, that's the, that's the, the global market. So to a degree we're self-insured, we're self-insuring by being a diversified business, although that doesn't come easy and it involves a great deal of management. So having our farm park and our other types of diversification de-risks our business to a degree. But what we can't afford to do is have an expensive farming hobby. So we do need to make sure our farming is, is, is profitable. Um, I do think that there, I say innovation, I think that there, there'll be new opportunities, but I am thinking that they're gonna be opportunities that we, we going to be domestic opportunities and some of those won't be in production so um i think one of the questions that's come up on the chat is in the absence of subsidies will some areas of the uk be unviable for production i think the answer to that is yes i think we'll have increasing regionalization where we get lots of rain we'll see you know as we do in the west side of the country we'll, we'll see um perhaps greater concentration of growing of, of the livestock and in the east where we already have a concentration of arable crops, um, perhaps increase special, even further specialization in those areas. And perhaps those farmers not choosing to um, pursue any other forms of support that are available, including those through new environmental stewardship schemes, because they'll, 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 they'll wish to pursue production and they will have the opportunity to pursue production because they'll, and they'll have the uh, the opportunity to, if they've got, they've got land that to give them yield to enable them to do so. I think the squeezed middle bit is the difficult bit, the bit of the middle of the UK, which we are sitting in where, where for instance, 300 metres, 900 feet up in terms of elevation. Our weather means uh, we get, it's very cold and can be very wet in the winter and can be hot and dry relatively um, in the summer. So we're very drought prone on thin soils. And we've got, Yields, average wheat yields, say three and a half ton an acre, or eight and a half, eight point eight and a half to nine ton a hectare, which isn't enough. Um, our current cost of production to make a profit in the absence of, um, in most years, in the absence of subsidy. So we either need to increase our output. I don't know that's possible. It's you, that soil yield limited unless there's a significant change in technology. But perhaps plant breeding um, and genetic selection may. Um, what may, may give us, particularly the UK government now announced yesterday that they're going to be looking at whether we uh, have a step change away from what the EU policy is, um, but or we reduce our cost of production. But we're already working hard on that. So we haven't been squandering the opportunity the last five years to work out how to be uh, uh, better and more efficient farmers. But what I do think is we may, we're going to see some of this direct support payments uh, being channeled towards um, environmental uh, stewardship and public goods and I think where you have a mixed farm like ours and especially one that welcomes public access and is as, ed as an educational um, string to our bow that perhaps there will be an opportunity to um, fill part of the gap with that and the other thing I think is what part of farms will play going forward in terms of carbon capture and sequestration and whether that market, I think we're going to see in the next 12 months got a big uh, change or development of that market and if we can get an accreditation scheme so that there's a universal way of measuring carbon um, in terms of production and sequestration and then there's a trading platform and relationships between emitters and sequesters then there could be a value in that and that may mean going away from being outright producers to growing crops or ground covers, perhaps as we call them, which are great at capturing carbon and we'll make our we'll make some money through doing that. So I don't think there's any uh, um, so I think going back to the question is and, and the gauntlet being thrown down is that I'm not convinced that 
export per se is the answer for us. I think there may be niches for UK British farming and some of the standards we have, the provenance of our products and the standing the UK um, has in the global market with some consumers, perhaps Asia, but I don't know enough, uh, enough about it. Maybe perhaps there are some niches into which we could be selling, but I think going head to head with the Australians and the um, Brazilians and the Americans on um, commodity production will be a race to the bottom and um, will be a short lived race. And I know who's going to win. Could I, could I just comment? Because I think yep. um, you've got the advantage of situation which you haven't. And so you've got your customers on your doorstep and you've got very, very short distances. So that, that's a huge advantage over us. Um, we can't compete in that department at all. But the other thing, getting back to the, the costs, uh, we had uh, an interesting little scenario a few years back when they tried to force us to do QA. And at the time, I actually emailed a lot of friends in the UK and said, what do you think of your QA system? I won't repeat what some of them said. But um, <laughs> we started doing a QA system here, which was, I think, um, the course I was running was about $300. Then the government decided that training in QA was something good and they put a subsidy in. Immediately, the courses went up to $2,700 for a two-day course. And I asked one of the farmers that had done the two-day course for $2,700, what did you learn? And he said he learned that his neighbour didn't wear pyjamas. <laughs> because he said he had to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to check if the, if the truck was clean. And he said he wasn't going to because he didn't wear pyjamas. So uh, we now don't have the QA system because our customers said that they test all the grain anyway and the QA system wasn't making any difference. But the point I'm making is when you're subsidised, your service people put the price up and absorb the subsidy. The grower doesn't get it. Somebody else does. And so we, you, you may find that some of your costs come down. Okay. Uh, the EU is our highest paying rapeseed market that we export into. And the British farm, you know, I've spent quite a lot of time in the UK. I've got great admiration for the British farmers. They're world class. So don't ever think that you're not. You do a great job. Um, the reason that your market is for rapeseed is such an important one and so highly paid for us because your growers have got one hand tied behind their back because so many of their tools have been taken away to grow some of the best rape crops I've ever seen in my life. But if you if you lose certain chemicals and, and products which because of your green movements and things like that, then you, you're going to struggle in that situation. So um, it's a, it's a <clears throat> Ke Kevin, we'll move on to that in a minute. John, John, you've got you yeah, you've got real, a prospect of this from yeah, real, from, from real, moving around the world. Yeah, real, real, real quick comment, and then we can move on to other things, um, Joel. But you know, went went back to the original question. Sort of, how, how's the UK scene? I, I think you know, again, I've been lucky. I've, I've worked with people all around the world. They see the UK like this: sixty-five million consumers. That's you know, it's not a, it's not sort of it's not Indonesia, it's not India or China, but 65 million consumers is quite a lot. Um, six supermarkets basically control the market. So in terms of actually understanding the market, it's pretty clear how it all operates. Uh, it's quite transparent. The enabling environment is maybe not totally perfect, but it's a lot better than it is in many other parts of the world. We're now free from some of the more restrictive practices maybe of or what I've seen as the restrictive practices of the CAP. I think one of the hardest jobs I've had around the world is trying to explain the CAP to, to people in Australia and New Zealand and Chile and sort of, sort of the reaction in Chile once was what, just what on earth are you trying to do? You know, so they, they didn't get it at all, basically. I think we've got, you know, we're <clears throat> economically, we're having a bit of a tough time at the moment as we go through the COVID process, basically. But UK consumers are still, again, at a global level, pretty affluent. We've got a very cosmopolitan food culture in the UK. It's a fast changing food culture. We can all go back to a time where sort of British food culture, what was that about? Fish and chips was as good as it got. 
Um, we've moved on a lot, a lot from there, basically. We're not self-sufficient and, you know, haven't been for a long time and probably never will be in, in, in lots of products. So I think the rest of the world look at the UK and think it's a pretty good market. Having said that, they also look at Latin America, Russia, India, China, Japan, and maybe Saudi Arabia and say they're also interesting markets. So that we're not the only game in town for people around the world or for our own farmers and food companies. Um, what I have found is that, yes, yeah, serving the UK market sometimes can be seen as a bit of a badge of honour. I remember being in South Africa talking to a grape farmer one night and he, 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 he sort of started telling me how difficult the UK supermarkets were to deal with and how he couldn't make any money from them. And, and this sort of, I thought I've heard all this before, you know, all around the world, basically. <clears throat> we looked out over his estate and the pack house and all this sort of thing and trucks going off down to Cape Town to ship grapes. And he said, mind you, without them, I wouldn't have any of this. So it's quite a telling, quite a telling comment. Yeah. So I mean, moving. I mean, I think the sort of question is, I think there is, is from my own perception, my my brother works for a, a um, fast moving consumer goods company, and the UK market is an interesting company for all and and products to be exported. But John, you touched on the fact. That, you know, we've now got some more freedom. We, we, you know, we're, we're out from some of the more restrictive methods. We've had a couple of questions in here, which I think, you know, come into one of, you know, really, you know, world trade talks, you know, how important is how food made, you know, it's providence, it's, it, you know, the technologies that are, are used, GM, you know, we, we can't in the UK use GM at the moment. Um, although, as you said, you know, we've got a review going on. Um, Neonicotinoid sprays, I've got that out well. I really stumbled over that earlier. Um, you know, and other and other products which which are available in other other parts of the world. Do those oh. sorts of, mm. of 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 restrictions do they just make us you know hold us back, or are they seen as important in other parts of the world, or is is it very I mean, is, or is it very mixed? Uh, a little bit of a mix going on basically what's important in the uk is probably less important in some other parts of the world but i think essentially um if i think uh, certainly in the uk certainly in western europe and in many other parts people are increasingly aware of how their food is produced and how it's being produced who's producing it how it's being transported around the world and these things are important you know not to all consumers but i think increasing number of consumers and i think if you look like <clears throat> the sorts of things we might easy talk about chicken from the u.s we just don't like the idea of that in the uk not all chicken in the u.s is chlorinated um hormone treated beef gm soya beans these sorts of things in the uk we for, for whatever reason for right or wrong we we just the, the consumer level we don't don't like the sound of these things so to you could have trade agreements that allow all these things to uh, be imported into the UK. We could have our own GM policy in the UK. Now we're free from the EC. Essentially, I always remember sort of a couple of years ago, Marks and Spencer's lorry would go up and down the moat of Britain saying on the side of the lorry, all our food is GM free. When that lorry goes up the motorway and says, all our food is packed full of GM ingredients, then, then, the market basically but i think there's still great reticence and it would be a brave food company or brave supermarket in particular to sort of extol the virtues of who's going to have a who's going to have a lorry going up and down the motorway saying all our chicken is chlorinated i don't know i i, I don't see it personally so i think again so the, the the regulatory environment this sort of thing is allowed but the, the but the market the consumer, the retailer, the food company might say, well, it might be allowed, but actually we, you know, our customers just don't want this for rightly, for wrongly. But what they would like is if it was cheaper, of course. But there's, there's a balance there. Yeah, I was, I was you know, just thinking, you know, you might get a water company, you might put all our products is chlorinated down there, down the side of their trucks as they roll around. But now you know, the, 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 food, the food food sector is probably well out. But that, but that is, you know, pri pricing, you know, consumer um sensitivity to price um you know not not just you know in the in the middleman going you know going for the cheaper but consumer sensitivity to price i suppose you know jane and kevin how how much does that affect 
Australian export? Well, uh, uh, the wheat that we produce here, we've actually bred it for the market for their noodles. You know, it makes bread and all the rest of it. Because we've been their predominant supplier, we taught them and showed them how to use our grain and it's a different process to American grain. So that sort of helps our market to a certain extent. But the grain coming out of the Black Sea, um, they're prepared to pay up to about a 40 dollar premium, so 20 pound premium, for our wheat compared to theirs. And that gap gradually closes because they can see what we've done. So they're trying to do what we we did you know, 30, 40 years ago. I think mm. I think also it's important to remember we used to have a single desk marketing system, the AWB. And when we had we lost that due to politics in 2008. Up until then, the wheat board exported all of our grain and they could build relationships with our customers and find out which barley they liked malting the best and which wheat was best for noodles. And then we bred our grain accordingly and they would, we would actually get recommendations from the wheat board. So that, that variety is not very popular. Don't grow that next year. And they would have a, they would have a list of the, of the varieties that they thought were best for us to grow and a price, um, attractive price to suit it. Um, that getting to know your customers was important. Sadly, we lost some of that with the loss of single death, but we're still- CBH just picked that up. Through CBH, the cooperative, we've managed to pick up some of that. So it's quite important. But they're very sensitive to price. Yeah. Know um, your customers. And you know, we've had flour mills, which were 90% our wheat, uh, dropped down to, probably only 40% of our wheat because they needed a certain amount of it to maintain the wheat because it was so cheap coming out of the Black Sea or Argentina. Um, they might shandy our good hard wheat with some lesser quality wheat from somewhere else. So it, it is, the world price is very, the world market is very price sensitive and it's very supply sensitive. So if you look at it, you know, I have a saying, if low prices will sort out low prices, high prices will sort out high prices. Because if the price goes up, so does the production. We're never going to run out of food for as long as I can see. You know, I've been told that in the 40, 50 years, nearly 50 years I've been farming, that at some stage we're going to run out of food. But every year we seem to produce more and more. There's the odd drought which creates the odd scare. But you only have to look around the UK at how much land has got horses and other things on because it's more profitable. If food becomes more profitable, I'm sure the farmers will find somewhere else for those horses to go. Mm. You know what I mean? But, um, it just balances itself out. And it's what really creates the hiccups when a government um, gets a strop on with you and slaps an 80% tariff on a, on a barley and you end up going through the world trade um, uh, arbitrator to, and they're putting that tariff on because they believe that uh, we're dumping it in China. And that it's just that our government turned around and said, we need to find out where the hell this virus came from. They didn't like that. So they said, we'll punish you. But as it's turned out, we're selling our grain at a better price than we were getting in China, elsewhere. So, um, the, the world price has gone up. Yeah. It went jump big time yesterday. Did, I, I mean, we've got, I mean, the time, I mean, the last hour has flamed by. We've got time, I think, for one very quick last question. And thank you, everybody, for putting questions on the Q&A. And, and this is something I'm going to, I'm slightly grinning here because I'm going to come to Duncan first on this one. Um, Novel proteins. Uh, most people sort of see that as insects. Um, I know. I I know. Adam himself has suggested that he might like to do some do some insect farming. Um, but but are these? I mean, I just sort of really take sort of a thirty one minute sign bat, sign bat, sound bite from all of you on this. But are they actually ever going to be anything more than a niche? 
a, a niche item in the market? Are they going to really replace fish, my nice steak that I get from my brother's farm? You know, are, are they going to replace those those things? Duncan, sorry. Thanks, John. Um, well, I think proteins, our source of protein going forward is a very interesting one. Uh, grazing livestock, um, perhaps being vilified at the moment as being one of the root causes of greenhouse gases. Uh, I, I think there's, there's been a bit of a one-sided argument there when actually, if it wasn't for that grazing livestock, we wouldn't have as much pasture land as we have, which is also um, a significant carbon sink. So it does need to be looked at in the round. But I can see that we do have issues, that there are some issues, um, certainly issues around feeding animals with other animals. So if the majority of farmed fish end up in ruminant livestock feeds then um, and uh, ruminant pig and poultry feeds, then I think we have got a problem. We need to address how, how we um, how we go about feeding our livestock in future so we're not decimating our oceans and um, and removing food from the food chain, which could be going directly into humans. So we might have to cut out the middle man or animal and um, and feed those fish to people. But so I think that, um, the future for grazing livestock and red meat consumption globally is probably not, is one we're going to see going to decline. I think that our view is, and we're breeders of, rare and traditional breeds is that um, we're likely to see uh, consumer habits eating. We'd like to be encouraging consumers. And uh, this is a demographic we're fortunate to have. People who are wealthy enough perhaps to make those decisions is to eat less red meat, but maybe eat their high quality meat, which is going to be of, um, you know, it's going to also going to be of high value. And then there's value added throughout the chain there. Where are, we, are we going to be, where are other source of protein going to be coming from? Well, engineered protein, is such as the burgers are starting to see coming out now, and meat produced in a lab is certainly, I think, a reality going forward, and perhaps is one of the answers towards helping reduce greenhouse gases. Um, and um, it's, I, I think it's um, not just about greenhouse gases, but there's also a, a large animal welfare um, uh, lobby and public opinion swinging towards more plant-based diets because of concerns about animal production systems. So I think we all have as farmers a great deal to do in terms of educating our public about the problems and quality of our food production systems. And Adam, with his role on national media, is, I believe, doing his bit towards that. And um, there's some mistruths or some misunderstandings, I think, that we need to, uh, we need, we need to address there. Um, I know Adam made this comment, hasn't got past the policy um, strategy um, of, of decision-making process within our business at the moment, about whether to spend a million pounds on building a barn and filling up with insects, um, uh, but I, and whether they will be a source of protein. I, I find that a little bit difficult to imagine at the moment in the UK. I think there's a, you know, generally there's a, um, our society has an issue with um, things with six and eight legs on, on them, and um, and we um, I don't think anytime soon we're going. I can see us eating locust um, burgers or um, or a, a, a fly um, a sausages <laughs> or whatever they might be. So um, I, 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 I yeah, further extensification probably of our grassland area, high quality red meat, um, and I don't think we're going to wean the Brits off their um, 60 million chickens a day or whatever we're, we're currently eating at the moment. Um, so, uh, but um, carbon taxes may be the thing that will, it's going to really change the way we go about production, I think. John, I mean, the insects are used in other parts of the world, yeah. particularly Africa. Um, yeah, I've just been making a few notes while uh, Duncan was uh, uh, talking to us there. And I, I've put a few things. I thought, I think it's Adam, it's, yeah, look, um, uh, I don't know Adam in the way that you do, Duncan, surely, but he, he's prepared to put a million in. If he came back and said, I'll put 10 million into this, I could be really sort of persuaded there's something there, maybe. Um, but I think that uh, w- one of the things I've learned in, in the the work I've done over the years, Joe, is never say never, basically. I think it's a bit unlikely in the UK we're going to sort of start eating lots of locust burgers and, and this sort of thing. There could be a generational change there. My, I've got kids in their 20s. Their eating habits are very different from mine. My son is a trendy 20-something 
20 year old something in London. I can see him. He he would probably try this sort of thing, probably just to shock me. Basically, I I would admonish him totally for trying to do you know to the, uh, the I think two of them two of them are um, sort of semi vegan. Their their eating habits are very different from their parents basically, and so never say never. But I think you're right, Joel. I think you know the more obvious opportunity is in parts of Africa and Asia where consumption of insects as a source of protein is much more niche thing. Um, there will be it might be more niche market, but there will be a market in the UK. There'll be some consumers who think this is a good thing to be doing or a, a nice thing to be doing basically. Um, but I would yeah. I would think sort of if if I if I had a few million quid and was thinking about doing this, I'd be looking at markets in uh, at, at this stage anyway. Certainly in other parts of the world, Africa and Asia in particular, rather than maybe looking at the UK market. But hey, come back and ask me in five years' time. I might be totally wrong. Um, thank you, John, Jane, Kevin. Last word from you. Um, Australians like to think about alternative protein. Uh, I know our dogs like locusts, but we only get a locust plague every so often. <laughs> They're very high in protein. The dogs love them, but um, they do eat a lot, and your garden disappears overnight. So uh, if you're going to produce them, uh, you're going to have to have a lot of food for them. And if Adam wants our flies in his shed, he's very welcome to all our West Australian flies. Yeah. Must be a good place. 50 million flies can't be wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I suppose one thing, Joel, if you look at, you know, look at the consumption of alternative dairy products in the last five years, you go into a supermarket now and it's, they're, you know, the supermarket shelves yeah. are packed full of, you know, almond milk, soybean milk, uh, pistachio milk and different types of alternative cheeses and what have you. So, you know, one thing can lead to another. As I say, ne ne never say never. I think, I think I'd agree with Duncan. I think there's other things that, that, that farming or food industry need to be thinking about. Um, I, I'm not sure that sort of insect consumption is the answer to everything it, we, we, we face here in the UK. But yeah, the t 25 years ago, if you said that if food habits change over time, what suits one generation may not suit another. You know, if, you, if you'd said 25 years ago that chicken tikka masala would be almost the national dish of Britain, people wouldn't have believed you. It is now. So never say never. And, what, what and certainly the... Aboriginal bush food is becoming more of a thing here, which, you know, 30 years ago it wasn't. So, yes, you're right, things do change. But what it's all about is the most efficient way of turning sunlight into protein. You know, I know from some insects, which they've talked about eating, and we've had plagues of them, and our sheep couldn't eat as much as what they'll eat in a day. And, and when you see a plague of locusts go through, they just... Leave the ground bare. It's horrendous. And um, you could have a lovely tomatoes in your garden in the morning. By 10 o'clock, they're gone. Um, so they do actually, you've still got to feed it to turn it into protein. And plant-based protein, I'll see that'll happen probably far sooner than, than the population leap into insects. But locusts, when they... When we go through a plague and they get all over the exhaust on your vehicles and everything, they actually smell like fish and chips. <laughs> you, I you, must, you must have been in a fish and chip shop, Kevin. That's all yeah, I can I just, I just, <laughs> Tell me where that one was. <laughs> well, on, on that note, I think, you know, f f f insect based fish and chips, maybe. Um, uh, it doesn't sound terribly appetising to me. I think I'll stick with my terribly um, unethical cod or haddock out of the North Sea. Um, but thank you. We, we we have run out of time um, to, today. Um, thank you very much to um, everybody for attending. Thank you very much to our um, our panel, uh, Jane and Kevin uh, in Western Australia. Um, Duncan um, sitting at 300 feet high in the Cotswolds uh, and John uh, from Promar, who uh, I think is sitting in Reading. But thank you very much to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, very apologies if we didn't answer your quiz question. We didn't get to it. As I said, you know, as we sort of agreed when we were setting this up, we could um, probably talk for several days on all of this. Uh, and we didn't really start to touch on things like carbon sequestration and and all those other, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 climate change issues which are, are coming down the line and actually going to face every farmer across the globe um, to a greater or lesser extent wherever they are 
uh, and whatever they are growing. And we also, you know, we touched on a bit, but actually I think, you know, as we're talking there at the end more about, you know, novel proteins, how is consumer choice and how is consumer selection going to drive the decisions um, that you know, farmers across the globe make um, in the coming years? And, and, you know, and I think that's a very interesting um, thing as well. So thank you very much to everybody for attending. I hope you found it informative and enjoyable. Um, and I'm sorry, we're eight minutes late, but um, uh, uh, that's it. And um, feel free to go about your day. Thank you very much.